Christian Conversations. I'm Zuri Walker, and today I want to talk about relationships. Now, of course, much of this information that we're going to be discussing uh, can be taken for any sort of relationship that we may have during life. So, friendships, family relationships, business partnerships, but the core of it is about romantic relationships. And of course, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a woman. That is my personal experience. But because all of this is found in the Bible, all of the advice, all of the verses that we're going to be reading, then really you can take this and use it whether you are a Christian young man or a Christian young woman. But I am just speaking from my personal experience as a woman. And I think that this topic is an important one. Um, it's one that I see avoided more than discussed or when it is discussed, it's kind of clouded in confusion and compromise. And one thing that we don't want to do as believers, as set apart vessels unto the glory of the Lord is to compromise. And the world that we live in is so fallen, it's so broken, even though we wait for that kingdom where Christ will reign visibly, eternally. Right now, we are living in a world system that is governed by Satan. No matter where you go on this earth, it is corrupt. And every one of us are born with a sin nature. Our natural posture is to, if you want to think of it this way, slump into sin. It's to fall into those things that we know that we shouldn't do. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all missed the mark of his righteousness. But through faith in Christ's testimony that he is the son of God who died on the cross for the sins of the world, that he rose again and is the only way to heaven, we are regenerated. We are adopted into the family of God. We are given a new life. We are filled with the Spirit. And when we walk in submission to the Spirit, yielding to His control, we can move from that slump of sin into a posture of righteousness, walking holy. Like I said, walking sanctified, that means to be set apart to Christ, set apart from the world. So, how do we do that? What does the Bible have to say about relationships? How do we interact with other people in this fallen world? At the core of all of our relationships should be a dedication to treating people with a purpose. And what I mean by that, I'm thinking about a particular quote by C.S. Lewis, and I'm going to put that entire quote up on the screen. But just to paraphrase it, Lewis says that we don't meet any ordinary people. When we are going about our everyday lives, we are meeting with other immortal souls. People who will spend eternity in either heaven or hell based upon their decision, based upon their free choice of or free rejection of Jesus Christ. And because of the fact that we meet no unimportant people, we should view them the way that God views them. We should treat them with pure, genuine, sacrificial love, showing them the hope that is within us, always being ready to answer for that, the scriptures tell us. Um, the Bible also exhorts us that as much as possible to live in peace with all men. We should not be going around picking fights. We shouldn't be elevating ourselves up, thinking too much of ourselves. We should treat others as we ourselves want to be treated. And we should treat others the way that Christ treated people. I am reminded of his words on the cross when he was being absolutely abused, misused by people whom he had not only witnessed to, but whom he was dying for, whom he is the rightful creator of. And he says, Father, forgive them as they are mistreating him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus does not tell us to fight back, but to turn the other cheek, to live 
a life worthy of the calling of Christ followers. So that should be at the core of all of our relationships, this very special type of love that we cannot truly experience and we cannot truly give out unless we are walking in the Spirit. And there is a very popular passage about this type of love found in 1 Corinthians 13, and I want to read that because just though a passage is popular, and it's been read quite a bit, uh, doesn't mean that it's not important. And usually those passages are the kind that get overlooked. We hear them over and over to the point where they just roll off our backs, and we don't want to do that. We want to really hear this passage and park and think about the kind of love that God wants us to give and wants us to experience, the kind of love with which he loves us. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's begin in verse 4 and read through the first sentence of verse 8. Now, I am reading in a New King James Version of the Bible. Whatever version you have with you, I invite you to read along with me. Verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Wow, <laughs> that is a really big list to live up to. And the reality of it is the only one who has ever lived up to this list is Jesus Christ. He is the only person who has lived a perfect life. We will never on this side of eternity love each other in our relationships as we should. There is always going to be some fault there. Remember we said earlier that each one of us are sinners and even though as believers, as born again Christians, we have this new nature within us, the spirit taking up residence. We also, the Bible tells us, have this war that is waged within us where we have flesh against spirit. We have sin nature against spiritual nature. And this war exists as long as we are on this earth until one day where we will be glorified in heaven. We will receive a new body. We will be separated from ever from the presence of sin. And then we will no longer have to worry about this war. But until then, we have to take on the full armor of the word. We have to fight this fight. But that being said, just because we will not love perfectly doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't look at this list of attributes for love and say, Father, help me to walk in this light. Help me to walk in this love, to love others as you love them. Just a few of the attributes going through here, love suffers long. It doesn't give up. It doesn't say, okay, you've wronged me. Now I'm out of the room. No, it suffers long. It's kind. Kindness, although the world may see it as weakness, kindness is strength. There is strength in being gentle and in doing the right thing. Love does not envy. It doesn't want what someone else has just because they have it. It doesn't look down on them and say, oh, if only I had that. No, love is happy for you. It rejoices in the fact that you have a blessing from the Lord. Love does not parade itself. It doesn't walk around and say, look what I have. Look how great I am. No, love is going to be humble. If it isn't humble, it isn't love. Love is not puffed up. Again, it's not arrogant. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. Love seeks the good of others. Jesus did not seek his own when he went to the cross. He sought us. That pain, that agony, that suffering that he had to endure was not something that was beneficial 
to his flesh. It was not something that was enjoyable to his spirit, but it was something that was necessary to open that line for relationship with us. And that for him was enough. That is love. Love thinks no evil. It tries to think the best in all situations. It doesn't jump to conclusions. It doesn't rejoice in iniquity when it finds out that something bad has happened. It doesn't run to spread and to gossip this news to others. What it does do, the scriptures tell us in verse 6 and verse 7, it does rejoice in the truth. It does bear all things. It does believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things. Love is steadfast. It is not weak to love. To love and to love purely as the scriptures talk about in 1 Corinthians 13, that is something very strong indeed. Verse 8 finishes the thought all around and says, Love never fails. If it fails, it was not love. We have nothing to fear, the word goes on to tell us throughout, because we have the love of Christ. When we rest in the love of Christ, that has been manifest on the cross. We know that we are in no danger of eternal condemnation. We know that as we sin in this life and we come to the Lord in repentance, that he restores us into that closeness of fellowship. And this kind of forgiving love, this agape is the Greek word for it, this sacrificial love that bends over and over and says, I give to you, I give to you, this type of love that provides more than it takes. This is the kind of love with which we are supposed to treat all people, not just in romantic situations. So this should be the platform that we jump off of when we go into any sort of communication with other people, believer and unbelievers alike. But what about getting into a romantic relationship. Coming back to our central point here. Well, we must remember what we have been discussing that as Christians, we are set apart, sanctified vessels unto the Lord. Our rightful service is to him. That is in all things, in every area of our life. We must work to keep ourselves separate from things of sin. And any sort of relationship that would pull us into areas that are of darkness rather than of light, that would take us away from the Lord, from what he wants for us, from his will, and take us over to the will of Satan, to the will of the world, that is not a relationship that we want to be in. And I want to say this especially to other young women because I have found myself in this position in past relationships and that is you do not have to do the work of transformation to make someone into who you want them, who you need them to be. I'll say that again because it is so important. You do not have to do the work of transformation. That is the Holy Spirit's job. Our work is to inform. His work is to transform. If you find yourself with emotions invested in a man who is not a follower of Christ, my best advice to you would be to pray for him. Pray for him if you have an opportunity. Share the word with him. Fulfill that great commission. But don't feel as if you have to risk your purity. You have to risk your purpose in order to change him. Um, the truth is, no matter whether we are dealing with a romantic relationship or just a friendship or a family relationship, any sort of um, discussion, conversation that we might have with other people, we don't do that work of changing the heart. We do the work of planting the seed. The Lord tells us to go out into the harvest for it is plentiful, but we are not going to reap that harvest. That's his work, not ours. 
we are not the ones that are going to give that growth. People have to decide if they want to accept Christ. We have that free will. There can be no true love relationship with God unless we can freely choose him. And that's why he has given us that will. But not all people will use that will to freely choose him. Though he offers us that pure 1 Corinthians 13 agape love. God has called us on the contrary, rather than to work and chisel and try to transform somebody, he has called us to relationships that are equally yoked. What do we mean by that? And when we say yoked, we're saying yoked without an L, not like an egg yolk, but like a yoke that would put two oxen together. It's a farming situation. And we are going to read about this illustration of uh, two oxen plowing a field in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. And at this point, you may be wondering, what do farm animals have to do with romantic relationships? Well, I promise something very important. So let's start with verse 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, Feel free to read along if you would like. Otherwise, just listen. I will be reading this entire passage starting with verse 14 and ending with verse 18. Verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. There is no way to confuse what this passage is saying. It is very clear. Do not get yourself into an intimate relationship situation with someone who is not a believer, with another individual who is not set apart unto the Lord, or else using this farming illustration, you will be like uh, two animals tied together working to plow a field where one is stronger or one is taller, one is shorter, one is weaker, and you're just going to go in circles. You're not going to get anywhere productive. Um, instead, one of you is going to be absolutely worn out. And the Bible tells us, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You can be the absolute strongest person in the faith. And when you hang around people, especially in romantic relationships, that do not share your Christian values, you will be pulled down to the pit with them. You will inevitably pick up some undesirable traits. And we do not want to do that. Uh, we do not want to do that because we want to live for the Savior who has bought us with his own blood. We want to be a continual sacrifice. Verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says that we are temples of the living God. Remember when we are saved, when we believe that testimony of Christ that we talked about earlier to salvation, the Holy Spirit lives within us. We become holy unto the Lord. And we do not want to corrupt ourselves with things that are unclean, unseemly, that would turn us away from the will and the purpose of the Lord unto our lives. These are very strong words in this chapter. What accord has Christ with Belial? Do not be yoked together with Satan. And you say, oh, well, it's not as bad as that. I promise I can change him. Sister in Christ, he will change you before you change him. 
not everyone wants to transform, even when they have been informed. Pray for a person. I am not saying that people cannot change. Each one of us who are Christians were once children of darkness, and now we are children of the light. What I am saying is that when we enter into intimate relationships, and when we date, this should be with the idea of marriage. When we are looking at a lifelong commitment to another person, we should make sure first and foremost that they are committed to the Lord. He needs to be, God needs to be at the head of our relationships. We must, in the words of the Bible, hate our father and our mother, our brethren, every other thing. Does that mean to despise them? No, but it means to put them in their proper places. God on top, other things beneath. And when someone is not completely sold out for the Lord, they are going to be putting things of the flesh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They are going to be putting these things above God and they are going to be asking you to join them. You must already decide in your mind what path you will follow. And the easiest way not to come into this temptation is not to be tied together, is not to be yoked with that person who does not share your convictions first and foremost before any sort of relationship begins. Relationships can be a heavy topic to think about. And it can be very discouraging as a believer in today's world. It is difficult to date, especially if you're doing this with the idea of dating to marry, um, with the correct vision of Christ at the forefront, keeping yourself pure. But such love such affection founded in 1 Corinthians 13 is absolutely worth the wait. And God knows our hearts. He knows what we long for. And if he has that person out there for us, he will bring them. He will give us strength to find contentment in him as we put all of our relationships in proper order, as we treat others with purpose and with love and keep ourselves holy for him. Because as the church, as members of his body, we are his bride before all. Even if we find ourselves married one day in that sort of commitment, Jesus should be at the head of our relationship. A married couple should seek him in all things, should honor him above themselves and even above each other. That is such a countercultural way of thinking, but that is what the word tells us. We were made by God and for him. And as uh, the quote goes, by Augustine. Restless are our hearts until they come to rest in him. Now, a word about singleness. Singleness is a gift. I know that that sounds absolutely cliche, and you've probably heard it many times before. While God has not called every person to singleness, he has called some. One of those in particular was the Apostle Paul, and Paul had a wonderful ministry all around to Gentiles, to Jews, to anyone who would hear the gospel. And because he was unmarried, he was able to put all of his focus to the ministry. He had nothing binding him to anything else except for his love for his Lord and Savior. And Paul even advises anyone who is single, if they can remain single, if that's something that they can manage without having a burning in their flesh for a relationship with a husband or a wife, he encourages them to do that, to remain single, to seek God's work. Now, it is God's will for some of us to be married. It is his will for others of us to be single. And of course, we have no way of knowing what that will is sometimes when we are going through life, when we're just starting out. Uh, we, we don't know. 
but God has a beautiful way of working things out for our good. Romans 8, 28 says, and he knows his will for your life. What he asks you is simple obedience right where you are. Pray for discernment. Pray for God to help you understand his will. But above all, rejoice. Whether you are married, whether you are engaged, whether you are single, rejoice in the Lord and seek to serve him first. Seek out his will, his purpose, his calling for your life, and do not become entangled in any sort of relationship that would inhibit that. We are called to be set apart, and my friends, especially um, my sisters in Christ, live out that purpose without fear, because God who has called you is faithful, and he will bring it to pass. Thank you so much for joining me today uh, in this discussion about relationships. And of course, we did not cover every single thing that could be talked about. There is so much richness, so much depth in the word um, about relationships between friends, family, romantic couples. But we have discussed just the very foundational things that we must live with purpose towards others. We must keep ourselves away from sin, away from unequal entanglements, and to know that even if we are uncertain of whether we are to be married or single, that one thing we know, we are to serve the Lord with all that we are and all that we have, to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So let us pray to do that as we go through our lives day to day. Let us strive to be faithful to him, knowing that he is always faithful to us. God bless you and keep you, and I look forward to joining you again soon. Bye!